stop recording. All right, so any questions about uh, the research project or the homework or anything? Yeah. Everything clear? Well, I guess. Mm, still deciding on which to do. Hmm? Still deciding on which to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one is about um, brown dwarfs. Mm -hmm. So it's about how they are similar and also dissimilar to white dwarfs and how you can study them with uh, polytropes. And then uh, what is the computational assignment? So simulate the light curves. And this is the, the second paper. The carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. Oh, yeah, the CNO cycle, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, there's a few options. Um, okay, so today we're going to look at um, closed binaries. So as the name imply, you have two bodies, two stars typically, and they are pretty close together. So before, uh, last week, we looked at the two stars In the case where they are so far apart that you can um, assume that you know, they're just uh, point masses. There's there's no interaction. Um, their structure doesn't matter very much or at all. So now we're gonna look at what are the conditions uh, for which that holds, and what happens when. That doesn't hold. All right, so I guess we can use the same. I have been using it. Is draw it over here. So we have the two masses, the center of mass, and then you know we have the 
two stars that have they look like that, right? So the radius is not negligible compared with their separation. So this is uh, x2, x1, and r is x1, um, x2, minus x1. So if r is of the same order of magnitude of this one, r1, then uh, what do you think is going to happen? What will be the most um, obvious effect of the gravitational interaction? Well, they might start to bulge a little, right, from over here. So they will start to get distorted. And then we'll look on like that. So this is called a tidal distortion. So they are not going to be you know, perfectly spherical anymore. So if you have something like this, uh, the you know, in general, you are going to have to solve it using uh, numerical methods. You cannot solve it analytically because um, density changes all the forces. But we're going to look at the case in which most of the mass is still you know, located within a sphere, and for the most part, you know, it's like a, it's a point mass, but it has some uh, atmosphere, you can call it, and some external layers that are um, affected by, by that gravitational interaction. Okay, so we're going to look at this part over here, so that is uh, delta M. So it's a small uh, chunk of mass that is on the surface of um, star one. I'm gonna call it, I guess it's star one. And it is going to be attracted to, to the second mass to start to. So if the stars are close together, then the orbits are going to be uh, very close to circular. So E is approximately zero, the eccentricity of the orbit. And so we can use the, um, I guess, the math that we developed last time for the Kepler's law. Okay, so if we have this situation, move the delta m over here.
then the gravitational force felt by these mass is going to be um, G M1 delta M over R1 squared minus G M2 delta M over R minus R1 squared. Right, so this has the right direction. So uh, M1 is attracting it in this direction, so the positive direction. And the second mass is attracting this in the negative direction. So you have the negative in there. And this is just the distance to the center of mass. So that's the gravitational attraction. Is there anything else? Um, any other force that is acting on that mass? So it's a centrifugal. Uh, so centripetal is the real force, right? Centrifugal is the uh, the inertial force. So if you're in the frame of reference of these two things, then you're going to you have to account for it. Uh, yes. So. So that second force, pseudo force, is going to be delta n, and then the centrifugal acceleration. So it's going to be omega squared. So x1 was from the center of mass. Um, to the center of star one, and r1 is the radius. So it is this is. And then towards the frequency. So then x1 is going to be m2 over the total mass times r. So you can put in there. This is going to look. Yes, M2 R over total mass minus R1 and then to that one. So because this is a circular orbit, the radius of the ellipse is equal to the semi-major axis, semi-major axis, so then we can use uh, Kepler's third law in this form. So R is the separation between the two stars, 
capital M is the total mass, and G is the gravitational constant. And so we can plug that one into here. Can we do a little bit of algebra? This one is going to be put the n over here, and then divide the whole thing by n. We can go to this one. Um, right. Then this is going to be, this is the total mass, so We can rewrite this as G over R cubed then to R and the same one R one and the same to R one. So if we write them separately, the two terms, we get two masses to get minus g, m1, r1, plus m, over r cubed, plus g, M2 R minus R1 over R2. We're gonna get rid of this intermediate one. Do they look similar? The gravitational and the centripetal? Do. So let's consider. I'm going to write this again. Let's draw this again. We have M2. Yes. Thank you. So we're going to look at uh, two limiting cases. So the first one is uh, M1 goes to zero. Right, so this is become smaller and smaller and smaller. So then uh, this term goes away and this one goes away. Then the next limiting case is R1 goes to zero. So this becomes more a uh, point mass, it has no structure, and in that case, we have the r squared over here, and you will have r over here and r cubed. This is an r squared also, 
And so this is negative, and this is positive. So if these two conditions are true, so the mass one goes to zero and R one goes to zero, then uh, gravity and centripetal are, they cancel each other. Does that make sense? So what would be that case? Mass is zero and R one is zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so this this DM still exists, right? So it's just a it's like a test mass. You can think about it that way. If you're not giving it a value or anything, you just want to know what happens at that point. You need to, to put your test in there. Well, it is. So this is not, you know, completely equal to zero, but you have essentially just have like a test mass over here and, you know, a big star. And so in this case, you just have with the rotation of this one. Um, so the center of mass moves closer and closer and closer to M2 because M1 becomes smaller and smaller. You just have the case in which you have some mass to the rotating around the star due to gravitational attraction. But it's general, right? It's like any, it's like any centripetal force. Um, but we're going to we're going to expand on this. But this is a condition when the two of them are together. Um, the two of them cancel each other. And the limit of small mass, small m1, and small uh, radius. Okay. Um, so if m1 goes to zero, but the radius doesn't, you still have some finite radius. Um, you know, and of course, for that to matter, they will have to be very close together. But if R1 is not zero, then um, These terms in the denominator. So uh, it's going to be smaller as the radius increases, the R1. Uh, is gravitational force, so it's up. And this one is in the numerator, so it decreases, so the centripetal. centripetal force goes down as the R is still pretty, R1 is still small, but increasing. So, right. So that also makes sense because um, if R1 is bigger, then it's going to be closer to M2, so gravity should increase, and the distance to the center of where it's rotating increases, so it should decrease as well. Okay, so... So there is a, 
uh, critical distance for which the test mass you know, on this uh, star is just going to move to M2. So M1 isn't going to have enough mass to hold into it. So if you have no velocity, right, um, in this direction, you just have a static system and you somehow start extracting mass from M1 at some point, you know, that piece of tape that you put on the surface of the star is not going to have enough force of gravity from M1 and it's going to move to M2. Does that make sense? So, you know, do not think like precisely of the case when M1 equals zero, but think about how, what is the behavior as it goes to zero. So, as M1 goes to zero, this term is going to be much smaller than this one, right? And this term is going to be much smaller than this one. Mm, no, no, no you're, you're just, ex this is a, you know, this, this doesn't happen in real life. This is just a thought experiment. Oh, de delta, delta M? Yeah, I'm not defining it. Uh, yes. But what, what you're comparing is this force with this force. And they both depend linearly on the M. So you can just cancel out the DM. The DM doesn't matter, delta M. So it's, you know, it's just to test it. The value, I mean, yeah. You know, in principle, it should be smaller than M1, but it's just a infinitesimally small mass. Yeah. So, so essentially, we're just looking at these two things. Okay, so, you know, at some point, the force that is felt, um, you can imagine that it's like a piece of tape that you put on the surface of the star, right? It's very tiny, not very massive. And um, all the mass is located at the center of this star, but the mass is decreasing. So the force that is felt by the piece of tape changes as you decrease the mass. And at some point, the force of gravity due to M2 is going to be greater than to M1, and it's just going to move to M2. Mm -hmm. So there will be nothing to hold it onto that surface and not enough force and it will just uh, move. Okay, so 
you want in order for that piece of tape to not move you want F of gravity plus the centrifugal uh, force be greater than zero. That means that it is in the positive direction. All right, so I'm going to rewrite these equations. So it's going to be G, M1, um, okay, M. We want that to be greater than zero. Or there should be a delta anywhere here too. So because it's everywhere, we just remove it. And this is greater than zero. So we can remove the EM. Um, and so we're gonna have G and one and then all this part. Greater than this one. So we have done the thing here with the M, we can take this M out. This one, the omega squared, we can put um, we can use Kepler's third law. It's going to be mg over r2. Now we can get rid of the g's. this M over here and divide the whole thing by M and then we can get rid of these M's and Yes, yeah, and two. Um, this one was a negative. We can put it inside. Yeah. And so the whole thing will be capital M. R1 minus MQR divided by RQ. So this is the condition. 
Um, title uh, distortion or title force negligent. Do you have um, mass one, mass two is the one that a large degree is more massive. Um, and one plus and two, and two, R is the distance between the two bodies, and R1 is the, the radius. So I plug in the values for the Earth and the Moon in there. So I use and in this case M2 is going to be the mass of the Earth. Six times ten to the twenty-four kilograms, and then M one is the mass of the moon. Um, Seven times ten to the twenty-two kilograms, and R one will be the radius of the moon. Um, Forty-seven times ten to the six meters, and R will be the distance between the Earth and the Moon. And that's two point eight uh, six four times ten to the eight meters. So, what do you think the conclusion is? Got um, on this side 2.5 times 10 to the 10 kilogram per meter per. And on this side, we got 4.2 times 10 to the 7 kilograms per meter. So, is the tidal distortion negligible for the Earth Moon system? Yeah, three orders of magnitude difference. Um, is it like negligible? I don't want to say in real life, but can we measure the effect of this tidal distortion? So are tights to do this? Um, but why did you get uh, like a low tide and a high tide? So what happens if, you know, um, Like the tidal forces are not negligible, you know, the, the two bodies are really, really close. Um, and you don't have a 
Uh, you have like a liquid ocean. You know, this is just uh, two rocky points. Mm -hmm. What will happen in that case? So, whenever the two bodies are very close, they're going to be tidally locked. Right? So, they are always going to be like the same part of the, the same face of the body is going to be facing the other one all the time. So, like Karen and Pluto, they are like that. Right? They're just rotating like that. The moon is tidally locked, but the Earth is not. And can you get a binary where both arms are tidally locked? Yes, definitely. So, if the tidal forces are very strong, then they're going to um, increase the angular momentum. Right? There's going to be work that they're doing due to the due to friction. Then that friction can be radiated away. So the end result is that they face the. We're going to look at that later. But they're, they're just facing each other, um, keeping each other the same face, showing each other the same face all the time. So you know the fact that the Earth rotates, um, you know that it's not tidally locked to the Moon. Uh, that's what creates the low tide and the high tide on Earth. Like, you know, like uh, you wouldn't have that in uh, with Pluto, for example, because it's always the same, same face. So what you will get instead is a uh, an elongation of the of the, the two bodies right towards the center of mass. So we're going to look at that um, in more detail. So, uh, this is for the case in which uh, we're looking at R1 closer to M2. Uh, you can also look at um, R1 farther away from M2. So instead of this spot, it will be this spot. And the same algebra, but this one will be positive. And then this one too. So these are equations 2.3. Two point three and two point two point four in one book. And if you uh, assume that R one is small compared to the total distance, then Walking backwards. Mm -hmm. Little by little. So the relationship is R um, should be greater than R1 1 plus 3 and 2 over 1 to the 1. Point. And what Weinberg says is that um, as you add uh, more mass or decrease the, the distance, then you're going to change the shape of the gravitational potential. So in order to make sure that this holds, you should make it much larger instead of just larger. Um, and I think this still holds uh, for the case of the Earth and the Moon. So this is called the uh, uh, Roche limit. It's almost like like your mass memory. Mm -hmm. Probably French. 
I mean, sounds happy. Sounds like it's a, a romantic language, Portuguese or French. Okay, so I'm selecting the values for uh, series A and B in there. So if you remember, series A is a visible star. Series B is a white dwarf, so you cannot see it with the naked eye. Uh, but they are a binary system. So um, the mass of B, the white dwarf, is 0 0.88 solar masses. The mass of the visible one is 2.28 solar masses, um, then you can let's try the different radi radii, radius of B, 0 0.008 solar radii, and the radius of A is 1.71. So I ended up with uh, 1 point, 1 1.7 times 10 to the 3 uh, solar radii over here. And then here the masses cancel each other out. So we decided it was 1.6 times 10 to the negative 2. So uh, you will not expect to see any tidal effects um, on this system. Yes. yes. Is that roof limit the same, um, like meaning the same conditions that we did for the for the tidal distortion? Yes. Limit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just using the the more simplified version, you know, when you assume that R1 is small, but it is still the Roche, uh, Roche limit. Okay, so the more interesting physics, we get it when this condition is not met. So what will happen, what, what do you expect will happen in that case? You get a what? A Christian disc. Yeah, that's a possibility. Why will you get an accretion disc? So you have, um, it is a rotating system, right? And you have mass that is being attracted to the other more massive body. So that's why it's going to create this rotation, uh, it's, it's accretion disk. Um, that, that usually is not going to happen. I mean, it's a, it could happen, right? Like if you have the two uh, bodies kind of colliding head on. But you know, in most situations, say that you know, they find each other randomly in space. They're moving in opposite directions. They get gravitationally locked, and then they will just start rotating like that. Yeah. Right. Mm. No, you will see why. It creates an accretion disk around the other one, about the second body. Yeah. But there's like this one point where it's gonna start to 
move from one to the other, which is called the uh, first Lagrangian point. I don't know if you saw that in uh, classical mechanics. The L1, L1 point. Any idea what the L1 point is? Have you heard about it? What is it? So it's where the gravitational potential between two bodies is zero. So NASA tends to send stuff to that point, like the L1 between the moon and the earth, or uh, between the earth and the, and the sun. And so you, if you can accommodate your, um, your equipment in there, <laughs> then you can just leave it there. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's no, no force in either direction. Okay, so um, we're gonna consider this case. You have your rotating system, and this is the plane. And this is not this here. So this vector is n hat. Okay, so it is. Uh, perpendicular to the plane of the orbit, so the orbital plane. So it's just kind of the direction of the beam. So, and we're going to consider some arbitrary point, um, x vector. So then, uh, if you put a test mass over here at x, the force Okay, so there are two ends in here. Uh, one is a dot product and the other one is not. So what is the value of this term if the angle between n and x is zero? So that means that that is, uh, sorry, um, 90 degrees. So it means that it's on the plane. Hmm? Uh, yes, the point X. Zero, right? So you only have the point X. And if you have it at zero degrees, so it's over here at N. Right, so um, so if if x is on the plane, then this term is zero, and this whole term inside the square brackets is just x. Uh, if it's over here, you know, just above, um, it is on n then this is equal to minus x yeah. and so this whole thing is zero the whole thing goes away which makes sense right there's no centrifugal force if you are directly above it okay. 
Right. So this essentially tells you, you know, it's like a three dimensional um, it tells you what the centrifugal force is at any point in space. Those are the two uh, limiting values. All right, so then over here, uh, this one, the V of X is the gravitational potential total. Gravitational potential. So if you take the gradient of the potential, you get the force. So this will be the total gravitational force. And so remember that force is the derivative with respect to distance uh, of some energy, some potential. So if you take the, you do the, well, so if we move the dx over here, then we can integrate uh, on both sides so you get just the potential. And so we can put together an effective potential that includes this term um, by putting this in here. So it will be that omega squared integral uh, of this x, I'm gonna call it x prime, the other one dx. Uh, so this is going to be just omega squared over 2 x squared minus this thing this x prime squared. So we can rewrite the whole thing in terms of uh, the potentials. All right, so this whole thing, we're gonna call it capital P. And it's getting a little crowded. So. So it's the actual gravitational potential minus the omega square over two divided by n times x squared minus x prime squared. Or well, what's x prime again? It's the thing we This one, just the one I write on the in hats. It's like the, the component uh, to the angle. <coughs> yes. But it's part of the centrifugal force. Yep. Okay, so then the force at any point is going to be minus your test mass 
in the gradient of capital P. So inside of a star, you have your pressure, you know, and up to the surface of the star, you have gravity or this force pulling in and you have the pressure. And the pressure could be you know, from the ideal gas, radiation, um, or whatever. So you have your hydrostatic um, equilibrium. But if you look at this other direction, so the tangential direction, um, what is the force? Is there a force? So everything, you know, the forces that we have really looked at are uh, radial, right? Um, in the tangential direction, uh, there's no force. So you can just, um, you know, push a ball and it will just move around in an orbit around the, the sphere. Um, it's not going to move closer well, because there's these uh, forces that cancel each other. So it will just move at a constant uh, velocity. So that means that if the gradient is zero, then the tangential component uh, is constant. So the point here that I want to make is that you can draw constant potential surfaces. Right? So um, you can draw it in two dimensions. Um, maybe do some animation to see it in three dimensions. I can imagine it in three dimensions. Uh, well, so in general, if you want to solve this equation, you need, uh, again, numerical methods. But you can think of the case in which the tidal effects are generally small or most of the mass is not subject to the gravitational, uh, to the tidal effects, but only the exterior parts of the star. So you have, um, so how will you call, you know, a diagram with potential lines that are, lines that mark equal potential? So let's say that you have your mass over here, you know, call it M1. Um, if I wanna draw where the, the gravitational potential is some value, how will it look like for one mass? It'll be like that. It's a circle in you know, two dimensions. A shell. So why is it a shell? Why is it a, a sphere? Um yes, so I guess it can, 
I'm just gonna, you know, write the whole thing. And then um, we can discuss it. So negative capital P, the equipotential surface is X minus M2 R over M squared plus Y squared plus D squared. And this is for point um, X, Y, Z. X one is M two R over M zero zero and X two is going to be M one R over M zero zero. Actually, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna write that. It's pretty long. Um, but this is the, I'm gonna draw it. If your, if your mass is, you know, kind of far away, not really interacting with the other one, then the gravitational potential is going to look like a shell. So it will look just like that. Um, this is M2, this is M1. So M2 is bigger than M1. Why are these lines, uh, why is this radius larger? So this, these are equipotential lines. So the gravitational potential is the same, you know, where these are drawn. Uh -huh. Right, so if you want the same potential for a smaller mass, you have to be closer to that mass. Mm -hmm. So that's why this one is smaller than this one. Um, so in the case where X, you know, the, the position, is very close to the mass, then there's not a lot of interaction between them and they just look like spheres, just like the regular Newtonian gravitation. Um, as you move away, the centrifugal term becomes more important. And so at some point, um, The equipotential, uh, it's okay. No, it's not okay. So what I want to show here is that you know, this uh, point is closer to M2 than to M1. So, uh, M2 is more massive, 
so it's less affected by the uh, centrifugal term. So these are these are equipotential lines. So um, you know, if you go from v, you know, equals some value, and then then you move up, uh, you start drawing these circles. There is a critical value for the potential, so it's a critical equipotential in which they touch at one point only. And if you keep increasing it, then the, the potential, the equipotential is going to look like this, right? So they form, instead of separate sections, they form only one. So um, this equation, you can find it in, in Weinberg. You know, it's, it's kind of long, but it's not that hard to understand. Um, and this is, you know, it's three-dimensional. So if you look at it in three dimensions, um, initially they just look like spheres. And then as you move to weaker uh, potentials, they become like drops. And this point over here, it's called, this is the first Lagrangian, so L1. So the potential here is equal you know, in every direction. So if the force is zero. Why? I have to think more about it, I guess. I thought that it was intuitive, but... <laughs> I don't No, no, I, I, think, I think you're right. I mean, the force is much lower here than here. I think you're right, it has to be closer to, to M1. Okay, so. Yeah. No, it is because the circles here are bigger than these ones. So it has to be closer to this one. You're right. Thank you. Okay, let's finish this. Um, so, you know, for a first approximation, you are not changing um, the shape of this potential. Um, you know, in reality, as you add mass, this changes. But imagine that this is constant, you cannot change it. And uh, essentially, the more negative potentials are deeper holes. And you can imagine it as a hole in two dimensions. 
you can imagine it as a hole in three dimensions if you can. Um, I don't think that there's much difference. So as you start putting mass in this one, uh, is, is going to be initially just a sphere. And that's what we observe uh, with, uh, with stars, right? They just want to minimize their, their energy. So they want to stick together to the minimum energy surface everywhere. But as you continue adding mass, and you know, imagine that the density is less, you know, you have some atmosphere or something uh, so that it doesn't change uh, this, this landscape too much. Then uh, this one, or this one, typically it's gonna be the less massive one. Um, the mass is going to accommodate in this shape, and then through this point, it's going to start passing um, mass to the second one. And it's because the potential here is higher. So it's going to have like one point to which it is donating more mass to the other one. So there are uh, three kinds of interacting binaries. So well, I guess binaries. Detached. So, oh, um, this volume over here is called the Roche lobe. So for the detached binaries, their their uh, Roche lobes are not full. So that would be like most binaries that you see, right? That's in everything. Um, the semi-detached, one of them is going to be donating mass to the other one. And the third one, um, not surprisingly, is a contact binary. So in a contact binary, both of them are going to feel their, uh, their Roche lobes. And so the one that is more massive, you know, it's gonna um, move more mass to the less massive ones, but they are actually in contact. So they're in thermodynamic equilibrium and everything. Um, so I've seen a few simulations, I guess it's difficult to see them with a telescope but it's like you have both of them and then you have the stuff, the connection in between and they're rotating pretty quickly. For the semi-detached, you have several options. Um, typically what happens is that this less massive one uh, is gonna uh, move out of the main sequence. It's gonna become like a red dwarf, uh, sorry, a red giant. So the mass is not very big, but uh, the volume that it covers uh, increases. And so it, it will pass this um, L1, or it's gonna feel the Roche lobe, and it's gonna start moving mass to the other one. So if both are, I guess, more traditional stars, uh, the binary is called uh, an alcohol type. If one of them, so this one, is a white dwarf. Um, then eventually, this one is going to donate just enough mass for the white dwarf to become a supernova, to go supernova. And the third one, they're called X-ray binaries. So you can have a neutron star or a black hole in here. And once it passes the um, the L1 is going to accelerate like crazy, as you might imagine, and uh, it produces X-rays. So pretty much all sources that are not transient, all sources of X-rays that you can observe um, is matter, you know, uh, something, you know, donating matter to a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, so that's 
what I have for today. Uh, okay, awesome. Questions over here, teams, people? Okay.